let's get started since we're at our scheduled time. Um, my name is Jessica Vionis, and I'm the Director of Marketing at Golden Helix. It is my pleasure to once again introduce Dr. Bryce Christensen, who has given several of our most popular webcasts in the past. Uh, Bryce is both the Director of Services as well as a statistical geneticist here at Golden Helix, and he has experience with dozens of public GWAS and sequencing data sets. Bryce earned his PhD in genetic epidemiology and biomedical informatics from the University of Utah in 2009. Before undertaking his graduate studies, Bryce worked for two years as a data analyst at Mayo Clinic in the Division of Biostatistics. On a personal note, Bryce and his wife had a new baby boy just a couple weeks ago. And with that, I'll pass it over to him. All right. Thank you, Jessica. And yes, as Jessica mentioned, uh, my wife and I did welcome a new little boy into our home about 10 or 12 days ago now. And so if I say anything today that is just patently ridiculous, I apologize. My excuse will be that it was the result of lack of sleep lately. All right. So let's go ahead and get started today. Our topic is maximizing public data sources for sequencing and GWAS analysis. And as we go along, if you have any questions at all or any comments, feel free to enter them in the question and answer pane as part of the GoToWebinar software. We'll try to answer as many of them as we can. Our agenda today is something like this. We'll start out by talking about a few of the reasons why you might want to use public data as part of an analysis. We'll talk a little bit about where to find public data and we'll review three or four different sources with some depth. I'll give you a few tips for using public data based on my own experience having worked with several different data sets from different sources. And then we'll talk a little bit about how you can manipulate and work with public data using the Golden Helix SVS software package. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right in and talk about some of the reasons why you might use public data as part of your analysis. What are some of the most popular applications? First one, and it's something that's illustrated on my screen right now, is using public data as reference samples for assessing population structure in GWAS. So you see the image there of a principal components plot where I've used HapMap data to anchor the principal components analysis and give me an idea about the ethnic structure of my study samples that are shown in orange. And here we can see the majority of them correspond with European ancestry, but there is also some both Asian and African admixture. And so that's one of the most common uses we see for public data, especially of the applications supported within the SNP and Variation Suite. Now, moving on, another very popular and I would say very noble use for public data is replicating the results of your own GWAS or other research. So perhaps you've been involved in some kind of gene finding activity, you have an encouraging result and you want to see if it holds up in an external population, you can go out and find data maybe from dbGaP or other sources where somebody has studied a similar phenotype in a different population from your own and you can use that to determine the robustness, if you will, for your own results. And I would warn you there, and this is a common theme that we'll be discussing throughout today's presentation, that um, you can't assume that you can cut corners because someone else has already processed the data. So if you're getting public data for this purpose, for replicating your results, you should still treat it like it's brand new fresh data that's never been processed or gone through any sort of QC process. Another very popular and growing use for public data is annotating DNA sequence variants. So with next generation sequencing experiments, whether it be whole genome or whole exome, we have variants that need to be annotated. And I won't spend much time on this one today, but I will say that in the near future, we're expecting to have another webcast where we'll talk more about some of the options for annotating data, especially in a more of a clinical sense. Meta-analysis and mega-analysis. So quite often you may find that, especially if you're working with a common complex disease, 
that there are several other data sets in the public domain that can be combined together to give greater power for analyzing a particular phenotype. Maybe you have your own GWAS as we discussed in the second bullet and you want to increase your power by combining it with a study from dbGaP and another study from EGA and something else that you got from a friend two states over. You know that's um, a great great thing to do. We'll talk more about some of the um, issues there as we go along, but obviously you get greater statistical power with increased sample sizes, and that is one of the more common uses for public data. Also, if you're involved with um, method development and you have new analytic methods that you want to test, public data is a great way to go, especially because a lot of the public data that's available also has published results that you can compare to. So if you have a method that you're testing, you can run it on a public data set compared to what was published for that data, and it works out very nicely. And in a similar vein, suppose you are evaluating software tools to do your analysis with. Maybe you are at a stage in your research where you're expecting your data to come soon, but you don't have your own data yet, but you want to evaluate analytic products so you can hit the ground running when your data comes. Public data, again, is perhaps your best option there. Reference data for SNP imputation. So, of course, genotype imputation is very common and popular practice right now for expanding the knowledge that we get from SNP genotyping arrays and quite frankly public data is usually about the only option available if you need a large population based reference panel for imputing SNPs. So that could be a um, thousand genomes project, could be older HapMap data, there are different options for imputation but most of them are public data sources. And this last one I put last because it's also one that makes me a little queasy sometimes. I suggest only as a last resort would you use public controls in the absence of having any of your own control data. And that's because I've had bad experiences with public controls. We'll talk more about that as we go along today. So what are the places that we can go to find public data? The NCBI is really a treasure, and within NCBI we find a number of different data sources, including dbGaP, GEO, the SRA, Sequence Read Archive. There are more beyond those, but those are the three that we'll give some attention to today. The EGA, which I usually think of as the European equivalent of dbGaP. Of course, the HapMap project has given us a wealth of data as well as the Thousand Genomes Project. GA is one that some of you may or may not be very familiar with, but it's a workshop held every other year that in most uh, years will provide a simulated data set that's representative of some of the um, common questions being asked in the field. And that data is archived and you can request access to it later on if you want to use it for uh, methods testing or any other purpose. Hardware vendors, those who produce the machines that produce data will often have sample data available for you to try out software vendors, including here at Golden Helix. We have some public data that we curate and provide to our users. And all around the internet. And what I mean by that is that you will find individual research labs, different consortia, and other groups who have some data available will sometimes post it, make it available on their websites, perhaps with different access and use restrictions. But if you know what you're looking for, quite often you can find it. So let's talk a little bit about some of these individual databases. And I'm going to give particular attention to dbGaP simply because it's the one that I have the most direct experience with. But dbGaP is the database of genotypes and phenotypes. When I looked last week, there were 435 studies in the database. I noticed yesterday that that number has grown to 438 now, so my numbers are a little off. It 
generally is known as a GWAS database, but the next gen sequencing content there is growing and quite rapidly at that. And um, through dbGaP, you can access the raw phenotype and genotype data for most of these studies, but also you can usually access and download the results for some of these studies directly. So if you just want a list of the SNPs that were tested and the p-values that are reported, quite often you can get that information um, without having to go through all of the application process. Now, as I mentioned, when I was looking last week, there are about 435 studies in dbGaP, and if you look at the breakdown on those, the majority are GWAS studies. There are also several uh, next-gen sequencing studies. And I don't know if these numbers are exactly accurate. It was the nearest I was able to estimate by looking at the available data. But you can see that you can find GWAS studies on dbGaP using just about every major um, genotyping array, and this is not an exhaustive list, I just picked the, some of the more frequent ones to get counts on. So the AFI 60 might be the most common chip in dbGaP, but Illumina has broad representation from their broad range of products. So if you're looking for data from a particular chip to supplement your analysis in some way, you'll usually be able to find something from the same chip, if not from the same phenotype group. Hopefully you can get the same phenotypes you need most of the time. In terms of NGS data, you can see we've got sequencing data on dbGaP coming from 454, from Illumina, GA2, and HiSeqs. So there's quite a bit there to see and work with. Now, beyond just having the opportunity to download the phenotypic and genotypic data, dbGaP does have some other pretty useful tools. There's something called the GAP browser that allows you to view individual GWAS study results in the context of other genomic annotations. The GAP genome browser is a tool that shows more of a karyogram or karyotype view of individual GWAS study results. And it's a, an interactive, clickable tool that allows you to see where the major signals are in a GWAS and click through and get more information about them. And there's another tool that is not unique to dbGaP. It also interacts with other NCBI resources. And I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, but I think it's called Fijini, which is the Phenotype Genotype Integrator. And there's a screenshot of that here on this slide. And what it does is allows you to search both dbGaP and other NHGRI resources either by phenotype or by genomic region. Here's an example where I searched based on prostate cancer. I picked that because that's something I studied a lot as part of my grad school work. But um, whether you search by gene or by phenotype or both, it gives you a listing of results from either dbGaP studies or perhaps from PubMed abstracts. And it's all clickable, allows you to get more information about it. I've found that it's a useful tool to learn what's already been reported about a particular disease if you need to go find out what's out there. Or if you have a result and you want to find out what else has been reported in that region, uh, this is a useful tool to find other results maybe from completely different diseases, but it gives you an idea about um, what's going on in that particular neighborhood of the genome. So when you get data from dbGaP, you do have to go through an application process. And before I go any further, I should probably give some credit here to Marilyn Ritchie at Penn State. She gave a presentation on this topic last year at the IGUS conference in Chicago. And I used a few of her bullet points here as part of my slides. But um, to begin with, be aware that every application is reviewed by a data access committee usually simply called a DAC. And it, the time it takes to get studies approved varies. I've seen studies approved in about a week. I've seen some that take two months or more. A lot of it has to do with the meeting schedules for each individual DAC. And there are some other factors related to your particular request that also seem to play into it. 
I found that you can keep the proposals relatively simple. Remember, you're not writing an R01 application. You're just asking for access to a data set that, quite frankly, they want you to use. dbGaP is not trying to keep people out of the data. They're trying to help you get the data and allow more people to have access to it. So I suggest that you read the instructions, make sure your application is complete, and if you have any special questions, I've found that you can usually contact the DAC directly before submitting and they'll be very helpful. Now, uh, another issue there, some data sets require IRB approval to access. And our experience at Golden Helix has been that usually a, a waiver letter is sufficient. I know that we've been involved with several studies with clients through our services division where we have needed to apply for access to the data, required IRB approval. We've gone to our local IRB here at Montana State University and they've reviewed everything and determined that um, there was no risk to human subjects involved and given us a waiver letter and that was accepted by dbGaP as sufficient. Pay attention to data embargoes. So if you're not familiar with that, what it means is that when data is submitted to dbGaP, typically the submitter has exclusive rights to publish on that data for a specified period of time. And if you access that data and attempt to publish on it prior to the embargo date, you can be punished. I'm aware of a particular situation where somebody was forced to retract a paper because they had um, they had violated the embargo and in addition to having the paper retracted they were suspended from accessing any other dbGaP data for a period of time so that's the kind of thing you can look forward to if you decide to break the rules now these last two bullets work hand in hand in some ways and it's important to pay attention to both of these External collaborators, including contractors, must apply separately for access. So if you have a friend at another institution and you're working together on a project, they need to get their own access to the data. So you cannot share any dbGaP data outside of your institution. And in terms of contractors, that's been my experience at Golden Helix in our services program. We have worked with a number of customers who as part of their project had some dbGaP data involved. We could not move forward with the analysis until we had also gotten our own unique approval to access that data. Now the last bullet there with consent groups. Um, within most dbGaP projects, I've found there are three typical types of consent groups. There's a general research use group where you can use that data for practically any purpose. The next one, the non-commercial use is similar. It can be used in any way you want, but people at a commercial institution like myself being at Golden Helix are not allowed to handle that data. And finally, you'll find that there are some subjects that are consented for disease specific use. For example, their data can only be used for asthma research or uh, diabetes research. And these last two bullets play together to an extent. So we've had experiences where clients have come to us looking for help with analysis project, but they wanted to use all of the samples available in dbGaP, including the non-commercial samples, and we've not been able to get access to those. And as a result, uh, we've had to, in some cases, turn people away, even though they were uh, not able to find a, an academic collaborator within the time period they needed. So it can be kind of a tough situation, but you always need to follow the rules. Now, um, in terms of using dbGaP data, just a few tips here. First of all, know what you're getting and read the documentation. So every project available on dbGaP has documentation that comes with it. You should definitely take a look at the original study design, pay attention to how the data was processed and formatted, and make sure that it works for your needs. I would say before you even apply for access and definitely before you start downloading it all. 
then also be patient and thorough as you explore the data. I've already mentioned this, but you should treat every dbGaP data set like it's a brand new data set that's never been touched before. I know a lot of it's already been QC'd, but it's, you cannot be too careful there. In terms of phenotype data, it's usually stored in text files, usually comes with a separate data dictionary. Again, read the documentation, make sure you understand how things are formatted. It's not always obvious. And take a close look at it for completeness and consistency. We found, especially when data is submitted from a multi-center study, it can be problematic occasionally where data from the first center is not formatted quite the same as data from the second, and you have to really take a close look at it as you're getting started with the project. In terms of the genotype data you'll get from dbGaP, there's typically three levels of data, and I've seen um, different things that happen with different dbGaP studies, but usually you'll get some raw data, so it'll be the cell files or IDAP files, that's the raw optical data that comes off of the chips. And of the three types, it's the hardest to use, but quite often it's the best place to start. Um, then there's usually some kind of initial process to data, so baseline genotype calls or log ratio values that haven't been filtered or processed too much beyond that might be one file per individual or all of the individuals from the study in a single matrix file. And then there's almost always a QC'd data set. And I mentioned earlier that you can browse the results of most dbGaP studies. That QC data is what you'd usually find in the public analysis results. And that's the easiest to use. It's usually in a format supported directly by SVS and um, you're welcome to start there if you want, but again, I say most of the time you're better off to start from raw or minimally processed data and do your own QC on it. In terms of the gotchas, some of the things we've experienced at Golden Helix working with public data from dbGaP in particular, we've seen things like gender discrepancies where the array data didn't necessarily match well with the reported phenotypes. We've run into issues of cryptic relatedness where samples weren't supposed to be in families, but appeared that they were. Um, we've encountered phenotype data that was formatted differently between sample groups, and we'll see an example of that in our little software demonstration at the end today. And incomplete matching of subjects between raw and processed genotype data. I've seen this more than once. It's kind of frustrating when you look at the raw data and there are 500 samples there and there's a different number with processed data and the crossover between them is incomplete, but it's the kind of thing that happens from time to time and it just requires you to make some decisions about what data you want to use and start with. And the big one that we see over and over is batch effects in the processed genotypes, especially when you start trying to combine data from multiple studies into a single analysis. And this is just one example of that, and this is from a dbGaP data set that was a multi-center trial where they had data collected from a few different consortia, but all for a similar phenotype. If you took the Caucasian controls from one center and the Caucasian controls from a second center and compared them to each other in a, essentially a case control GWAS, we find a lot of huge signals. And if you look at the QQ plot on this, obviously there are some severe departures from normality. When you go back and look at the individual SNPs with these strong associations, a lot of them turn out to be things where in one group the SNP was called monomorphic. Nobody's carrying a minor allele. While in the second group, there's a minor allele frequency between 5 and 10 percent maybe. And it's usually the result of a batch effect where if you go back and recall the genotypes together, maybe use something like Beagle Call to get that done, it all goes away. And so again, you just need to be vigilant with the QC whenever you're working with public data and whenever you're working with your own data for that matter. 
So let's move on now and talk a little bit about GEO. GEO is one of my favorite places to get data. It's the gene expression omnibus. It is primarily known as a gene expression database, but it also includes some pretty extensive genotyping data. And uh, one of the reasons I really like to use GEO is that it has pretty liberal data access rules. So anybody can access and download the public GEO data without login requirements and NCBI places no restrictions on the use or distribution of GEO data. However, some submitters may claim copyright or IP rights to all or some of the submitted data. So there are some issues to be aware of, but for the most part it's a place where you can go when you need to get data in a hurry. And based on my own review of GEO over the last couple weeks, there are about 3,400 studies there, or series as they're usually referred to within GEO. Um, between a third and half of them are human data, so there's a lot of data in GEO coming from model organisms. If you look at the human data sets, about half of them are flagged as containing some SNP array data, but the thing you'll notice is that the sample sizes are a lot smaller than what you get from dbGaP. So in dbGaP, everything is focused on these GWAS studies that may have several thousand samples. But in GEO, you'll find that a lot of the studies are uh, maybe based on somatic tissues where they've used a genotyping chip to look at copy number variation. And I've gone ahead and submitted the called genotypes into GEO as part of their data submission together with the CNV data or whatever. And so you get a lot of samples with 10, 20, maybe 40 samples in a study and a handful that are much larger, more on the GWAS scale. Um, when you browse through GEO, uh, it took me a while to get used to it the first time I discovered GEO, but it has some really useful features. It allows you to browse data by platform to get every um, sample or study that uses a particular chip. So we see a screenshot here of browsing by the Illumina 610 chip where you can see there are 1500 samples and 30 studies that have submitted data from the Illumina 610. Mm, excuse me. And you can click through and download any individual sample you want or the data from any of these studies that you want. And that's really helpful, especially when you're looking for control data or just need an example from a particular chip to test a method with. Then you can also browse by study design. So I don't have an example of that here, but for example, you can browse according to studies where the design is SNP genotyping by SNP array. And there's about 400 of those in human. Then if you look at genome variation by SNP array, um, these are mostly going to be CNV studies, but you get yet a different count there. So in my experience with GEO, I'd say it's especially a good place to get reference data and test data. If you're looking for data for a particular phenotype, dbGaP is really the place to go. But um, when you look around on GEO, you will find several human diversity panels that have been posted. Illumina has posted data there for HapMap samples from several of the Illumina chips. Um, there are also some other diversity panels there from Mayo and from NIA and from a few other institutions. I found those are kind of helpful to look at sometimes in the context of principal components analysis if I'm trying to verify ancestry on some samples. But on GEO, you'll find most of the time both raw and processed data formats. There's one called the series matrix file that's there for most studies that is pretty easy to work with. And we'll see an example of that in a few minutes. So the next one I'd like to talk about is SRA or the sequence read archive. It used to be called the short read archive. Some people still call it that. And I personally have not used SRA very much, but if you look at the description of the database, it's an archive for NGS data from various genomes and several different platforms. And the various genomes part of it is important. If you, um, some of you may recall a few weeks ago, we did a webcast where um, Greta, our senior biostatistician here at Golden Helix, used data from 
uh, bovine sequencing that was taken from SRA. So she had data from cattle and bison. And so you can find a lot of sequence data from different model organisms there. SRA does um, share NGS data with their counterparts in both Europe and Japan. And the last bullet here provides access to data from human clinical samples to authorized users. And so there is a link between SRA and dbGaP where some of the sequence data from dbGaP studies is available through SRA, but you have to get access by applying to the appropriate DAC at dbGaP to get that data. Um, in terms of our experience with SRA, you can check out our blog at blog.goldenhelix.com. The most recent post there is from Andrew Gisaitis, who's one of our developers here who helped Greta with the data processing for that bovine data. And he has a pretty good story here about his experience of working with SRA. And so I encourage you to take a look at that when you get the chance. So the last database we'll profile is EGA. And frankly, I've only applied for EGA data once. But I would generally consider EGA to be roughly the European equivalent of dbGaP. And in fact, you can search a lot of the EGA data sets through dbGaP. For those of you in the United States who might not be as familiar with EGA, it may be more familiar to you as the place where you go for Welcome Trust data. That's been my experience with EGA, was applying for some Welcome Trust data. And last year at IGUS, there was a talk about the resources at EGA. I took a few notes there, and just from my notebook, I recall that there are about 450 studies available, some pretty extensive sequencing data, a lot of BAM files, a lot of FASTQ files, and it's growing really fast. And in terms of my personal experience with EGA, I'll just say don't forget to request the decryption key. I don't know if the process has changed since the last time that I used it, but we downloaded all the data and we're ready to go on the project and then discovered that we couldn't decrypt it without the key and the decryption key was sent by FedEx and so we had to wait a couple extra days to start the project so that we could get the code FedExed from the UK to Montana. So um, pay attention to some of those minor details that you might overlook when you first read through the documents. So in terms of other sources that are out there, I already mentioned GA being a useful place to get simulated data. I found especially helpful for method development. Um, Illumina, we've already mentioned, provides example data for a lot of their genotyping chips. And some of the imputation programs out there have downloadable thousand genomes reference panels that are already in the right input formats to use. Those can be especially helpful for imputation, but also sometimes for other purposes. It's a quick place to get to that data. And here at Golden Helix, through the SVS software interface, there's a download menu where we do have a handful of curated data sets from HapMap or Thousand Genomes and Complete Genomics that you can pull into your analysis. So with that, I'd like to just talk a little bit more about some tips for using public data. I've already mentioned some of these as we've gone along, but there are a few more points I'd like to emphasize. Um, First of all, read the documentation for a data set before you download the full archive. In dbGaP, for example, some of the GWAS projects, if you get all of the raw data, so all of those cell files or IDAT files, you could easily be looking at half a terabyte, over a terabyte, a lot of data in there. and. Sometimes all you might need is just the processed genotype calls, which could be half a gigabyte, it could be just a few megabytes in some cases. So it's good to read through it all before you start downloading and figure out what you really need to get. I've said it before, but I'll say it again, be vigilant with quality control and you can't be too careful, especially when you've got data coming from multiple sources. Uh, recalling genotypes is never a bad idea. So we've had really good experience, especially with BeagleCall for 
recalling genotypes across several studies to reduce batch effect issues. Also, um, if you're not recalling the genotypes, pay special attention to strand orientation. Uh, both AFI and Illumina have about three or four different strand orientation options that can be used when you're exporting data. And most of the time, people are pretty consistent with what they use, but sometimes they're not, so you have to watch out. Um, and again, it's best if the sources were all genotyped with the same array. That helps to at least somewhat reduce batch effects. But if they're not, imputation is a pretty good option for combining data from mismatched arrays. And always, always, always adjust statistical tests for the individual data source. So if you're combining data from four or five different studies, it's usually a good idea to adjust your tests accordingly. Now, um, the last thing here, examine results before reporting or publishing. So if you have a significant signal, go back, take a close look at it, look at the raw data if you've got it, make sure that it all makes sense. If something seems out of place, it probably is. And give special attention to results involving rare alleles. So that example I showed a few minutes ago with the really extreme QQ plot, most of the noise in that data was coming from SNPs with low frequency, so around 5% or less. That's where, in my experience, most of the batch effect problems come from. Now, as I've talked to people, mostly to Golden Helix clients, about some of the challenges they have when they're trying to work with public data, there are a few common themes. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but one thing we hear from time to time is that the files are really big. And to that, all I can say is welcome to bioinformatics. The, the files are going to be big. There's not much I can do about that. But um, working with public data is no different than working with original research data. You need to have the right hardware to deal with it. Um, people sometimes wonder if you've got to have a Linux computer to work with dbGaP data, and I'd say no. I actually do most of my analysis within a Windows environment, but it is helpful to have a Linux emulator, something like Sigwin, and to know a little bit of um, a little bit of Linux to help you manipulate and work with the data, and also some compression utilities like 7-Zip or WinRAR can be helpful. Now, data formats. It's true that you will encounter a lot of different formats out in the public domain. On dbGaP, most of the formats are pretty standard, and quite often we can read them directly by SVS. So if you are using the Golden Helix SNP and Variation Suite, we can help you interact with most of the formats you'll encounter. If you find something you're not familiar with, let us know. We very likely have an import script that will work for that. And then this last one, a lot of the data that you'll find floating around the internet is in a plain text format. And it's usually not too difficult to work with plain text, but it does often require a lot of manipulation to get it into the format that you need. And to that, my response is great. Data manipulation is one of the most powerful features in SVS. And that's something that I want to demonstrate a little bit of in the time that we have left. So SVS, for anyone who's not familiar with it out there, is a very powerful tool for both management and analysis of a number of different genomic data types. And um, as functionality for SNP data, for DNA sequence data, for a lot of different data types, but what I'm going to show you today is going to be based on some SNP data. I'm going to go ahead and close out of the slideshow for a minute and show you exactly where this data we're looking at today comes from. So this is a data set available on GEO. You can see the access number here, GSE 1317. And the title of the data set is Genotype Dating from 120 Trios with Unexplained Mental Retardation. As we scroll down further on the web page, we see what platforms were used. So it's 
Affymetrics 250K NSP and the 250STY. So those two chips together make up the Affy 500K. And when we look at the data that's available for download here, there is the series matrix tests, excuse me, the series matrix text file. And there's actually one file for each of the two chips. So that's how you interpret the GPL 3720 and 3718. Those are, those correspond to the two platforms. And we see there's also an Excel file available for download here. And I have both of that text file and the Excel file downloaded and saved on my desktop. So here's the text file and the Excel. And let's go ahead and open SDS and take a little bit of a look at these. Now, um, SVS is project oriented. I'm going to open a project that already has some data in it. And let's take a look at a sample spreadsheet to get an idea what it is we're trying to do. So what I have here is HapMap data from the AFI 500K, so it should correspond pretty well to that geodata. And you see we have a spreadsheet with all the SNPs in columns, the samples in rows, the genotypes have an underscore limiter character, and there's an embedded marker map that I can open up to see some annotations about each individual SNP. So this is what we're trying to create. But in terms of what we're starting from, I have that text file here in a text editor so we can see it. And what you see here in the text editor in Emacs is very different than what you see in this spreadsheet. So we have to turn this into that. And as we look here, we can see at the top of the file, looks like there's a lot of um, series data. So this is study level data. If we scroll down a little bit, we see a bunch of sample level data. And then further down, we see all of these genotypes. And it looks like the orientation is opposite of what we need. It looks like we have SNPs in rows instead of columns. We just have AB genotypes and no delimiter. So we need to figure out how to get that all into SVS. So from SVS in the import menu, you'll find a lot of options for different file types. But the one we're going to start with here today is the text importer. And I'm going to select from my desktop that matrix text file. I saw that it was tab delimited. And in the advanced options, what I'd like to do first is get that section of sample data at the top. So if we look at it one more time, we see up here this sample data. And I can click and recognize, well, actually, I can't see right now, but I already checked earlier. I know that that starts with row 38. So I'm going to skip the first 38 rows and stop reading when we get to this series matrix table begin. So back here, we're going to skip 37 rows and stop reading when we get to series matrix table begin. Make sure I typed that all right. It looks like I did. Go ahead and run this. And we see that this new spreadsheet has appeared in the project navigator. If I bring that to the front, whoops, we now see all of that same data from the text file is in an SVS spreadsheet. If we scroll through here, we can see that really the only fields that ever change are row nine, the which looks like it's sample characteristics and it's um, telling us whether we're looking at children or parents, and then there's this ID number at the top, which is actually the important one that we need to match this up with the genotypes. So we need to do a little manipulation on this data. We already saw that we need to have samples in rows. So the first thing I'll do is transpose the spreadsheet. So click the transpose button, change one option there, and just like that, I've got the spreadsheet turned to have samples in rows. But now I also know there's only a couple of columns here that really change. And I'm going to create a subset of just those columns that seem to matter. And to do that, I'm going to first turn off 
all of the columns, so make them inactive. You see the text just turned gray. That means they won't be used in the next function I apply. But then I'll reactivate just that ID number and the sample characteristics and create a subset. So now I have the spreadsheet just of the data that I care about. I'm going to go one step further, which is to take this into the spreadsheet editor and change which column is being used as the sample identifier. So that far left column in SVS is the row label that gets used for um, merging and joining with other exam or other tables, for example. So we'll save those changes and we'll just call it final sample data. Okay. And we'll close this all down a little bit and come back to our project navigator. We see that table is right there after the work we did. Now in terms of the genotypes, um, I went ahead and read this in in advance just because it takes a few extra minutes, but it's the exact same process and I've got that all right here. We start by importing from the text file. You can see that I told it to skip 73 rows and stop when it sees this particular string. It took three minutes to do. And that produced this table that is in the same orientation as what we saw in text file. But first thing that needs to happen here again to get it into the preferred SVS format of having being SNP major is to transpose it. So I already did the transpose. So here's the transposed version. And then the next big issue with this is you notice the blue letter C at the top of each column. That means SVS is reading this as categorical data as opposed to being genotypes. And the um, another symptom of that is that you don't see the underscore delimiter. That turns out to be a pretty common issue that we encounter and because of that in the edit menu there's a function here for adding an allele delimiter so you can specify what the missing value code is here. So I would type in no call and run this but I already did it. Again it takes maybe three or four minutes to run that process. But then I get this spreadsheet that's starting to look more like the target that we're, we want to create. The last thing we need to do to make it look the same as our HAP map data is to add a marker map and also to convert these alleles from this raw AB format to match the ACGT format that we see in the HAP map data. So we'll go ahead and do that right now. From the file menu, I can choose to apply a marker map. And we have a number of different marker maps available for download. Um, the one I'm going to use here is just the AFI 500 map that's the same one that's in the, in the HAP map data here. So we'll go ahead and apply that. This will take just a second. So I now have a new version of the spreadsheet where all the map data is in it. So I can see that now. And then this last step is a really interesting one, which is that we need to convert all these A's and B's into ACGT. And it turns out that the information we need to do that is already embedded in the map. And so from the edit menu, I can choose to recode genotypes and transcode the AB mapping into ACGT based on that reference allele field. Click OK. This will take just a moment and we'll get a new spreadsheet that's all ready to go. Here we are. Now I meant to tell it to drop some of these unmapped columns. Some of these things at the beginning with the AFFX, those are SNPs that are used internally by AFI metrics for normalization purposes. They don't get mapping data. But everything else here looks good. It's all ready to go. Now I want to back up for a minute and take a look at that Excel spreadsheet that we downloaded. When we look at it in Excel, it all seems to make pretty good sense. It looks like we have some identifier data, although it's two numbers in one field and delimited by a comma. So that's something we'll need to deal with. Otherwise, it all looks pretty straightforward. It looks like we have some pedigree information, 
and some technical data about when the samples were hybridized. But we should be able to read that one in without much issue. And SVS can read directly from Excel. So here I'll choose to import an Excel file from my desktop. I think everything else here is ready to go. So now we have it in here. But we need to do a bit of manipulation to make sure that we have the right ID numbers so that we can match up this data. And the first, well, <clears throat> excuse me, I already took a look and I know that the first value in each of these cells is the one that we need to keep. So that makes it easy. I can come into the editor and there's an option here to do a column split. So I can split on a specified delimiter, tell it to split on the comma. Okay, I now have two columns. I can take one of them and turn it into the row labels. Save this, we'll call it final clinical data. Okay, now we're ready to go. So at this point, I'm pretty much ready to push forward with some data QC and analysis. I have my cleaned up clinical data down here. I have my cleaned up sample data here that came from the big text file. And I have the recoded SNP genotypes. Now I want to do just a couple more steps here before we wrap up. And the first thing I want to do is take this SNP data and just get some sample summary data. So from the genotype menu, I can choose genotype statistics by sample. I'll calculate um, X heterozygosity for gender inference. I'm going to change that value a little bit because I know it's noisy here. We'll let this run. And when it's done, one of the results we'll get in the output spreadsheet is a per sample call rate. And you may have noticed that in the Excel file, that we imported, there was also a column that was called B-Realm call rate. B-Realm is a calling algorithm commonly used for Affymetrics data. I want to compare these. So here's the call rate that I just calculated. And I'm going to merge this with that final clinical data. So this is what came from the Excel spreadsheet. And I have them both in one spreadsheet now. I want to compare them and I'll create a scatter plot to do that. So I'll put my calculated call rate on the x-axis that reported B-Realm call rate on Y and make a plot. And <clears throat> immediately we can see that something looks funny here. We've got a cluster at the top right and a cluster down at the bottom right. And I'm not expecting the values to be exactly the same. We can come up here and see a general trend where um, higher values that I calculated correspond with higher values that were reported. It's not a perfect linear relationship, but again, I'm using one of the two chips from the AFI 500K. This may be based on having both of them. And also, um, I don't know if they did sample call rates before or after filtering bad SNPs, if they included um, sex chromosomes, that kind of thing. So I'm not expecting it to be exactly the same. But the thing that really confuses me is that down here at the bottom, we have another cluster of data. And what it looks like is that this reported call rate is recorded two different ways. And in fact, that is the case. In some samples, it was reported on a scale of zero to one as a proportion. And in other samples, it was reported on a scale of one to 100. I said earlier that when you're working with public data, occasionally you'll find issues of inconsistent formatting. This is one of them. And I have no explanation for the data that's down here around 20% on the call rate. But if we come back to the Excel spreadsheet as it came from GEO, you can look at this column of B-Realm call rate and you see up here at the top a bunch that are recorded as a percentage from 1 to 100. Then suddenly there's a range where the entire appearance of the spreadsheet changes 
that's suddenly centered in the columns and values are highlighted and it's mostly ranging from about 15 up to 25 percent. And then down at the bottom of the spreadsheet it goes back to being whole numbers as opposed to a percentage this time. And when you get it from GEO back here, all you know is that this is clinical info Excel spreadsheet. And so those are the kinds of things you really need to watch out for using public data because this, when imported, all of those percentages up here get converted into proportions. The whole numbers down here stay whole numbers and there's really no explanation for these values in the middle. So <clears throat> um, I'd love to push ahead here and do some other analysis and manipulation on this data, but hopefully what you've seen is that we can read different formats. I've shown you an unusual text format together with a basic Excel format, but there's a lot more to it than that. And we can do a lot of manipulation inside the software, whether that means splitting columns on delimiters or combining columns or doing transposes or converting text into delimited genotypes. A lot of those kind of basic standard things are covered by standard functions in SVS. So back here where we were, where we left off, we're about out of time. So I'd just like to <clears throat> um, <clears throat> let you know that if you have any questions or comments or want to learn more about the software, you can email us. Um, standard email of info at goldenhelix.com. You can check our website. And with that, Jessica, do you have anything you'd like to add? Are you still with us there? I am. Um, thank you so much for that great webcast. There was really some great information on public data that's out there, Bryce. Um, if you haven't already answer, answered, or I'm sorry, asked your question during the webcast and the questions pane, please feel free to go ahead and enter them now. Um, we'll answer as many as we can in the next five or ten minutes, but if we don't get to your question, we will try and get back to you individually. Uh, as Bryce mentioned, if you were amazed and awed by the data management capabilities of SVS and would like to try it out, uh, please visit our website and there's an evaluation request there or you can just send us an email. One quick side note, if you are at Tricon next week in San Francisco, make sure to attend Gabe Rudy's short course on NGS alignment and variance. And if you're in Marco Island next week for AGBT, let us know. We'd love to say hi while we're there. All right, over to our questions. Uh, the first question we are always have, which I'll answer right off the bat, is yes. This webcast was recorded and we will be putting it up on our website tomorrow along with the slides. All right, I'm going to head over to do some questions now. Is GEO for expression data or SNP data? Um, so G GEO, if you look at the name, it's the Gene Expression Omnibus. It's really designed for expression data. More specifically, it's designed for functional, uh, functional genomics data but it contains a lot of SNP data as well. And what I've found is most of the SNP data that's there is a byproduct of people doing either um, SNP by gene interaction studies, um, looking for SNPs that are related to expression, or else it's there as a byproduct of some kind of copy number experiment that's been done using SNP arrays. So most of the SNP data sets you would find on GEO will also come with some expression data attached. It's not always the case, but it happens quite often. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, what do you mean by you can't cut corners with public data? Do you mean you can't assume that the analyzed and quantified data deposited by other people is trustworthy? What I mean is um, whenever you do an analysis project, you should be very vigilant with QC. And in dbGaP, you'll find that most of the submitted data sets there have both the raw data and some QC data. The QC data usually has some um, documentation with it that explains what they did. I would suggest at a minimum that you should try to replicate 
their QC and make sure that it all lines up because most of the time it is correct and in fact I can't specify a time where I've ever found one that was not done the way it was explained but I've also learned from experience that when I do my own QC and uh, spend some time getting to know the data that uh, the analysis just seems to go smoother. If there are any gotchas in the data they come out in QC rather than coming out uh, somewhere down the line when you're reviewing results. So it's not necessarily that, that the person's not trustworthy, just that the quality control you might want to do just to make sure the data is of a good level might mm -hmm. be different. Yeah, you, you may want to use different parameters, different filters. Um, you might just have ultimately a, a different purpose for the data. Okay. Uh, is there any feeling for how reliable SV imputation from a thousand genomes data is compared to that? Uh, for SNPs. So structural variation, I assume, uh, by SV. Um, so the issue there is that most structural variants are kind of rare. Um, not all. There are, especially with indels and small CNVs, some are very common. And the more common the variant is, the better the imputation quality will be. And you know, you can go back and look at some papers. For example, the there was a big Welcome Trust CNV paper two or three years ago that uh, spent a lot of effort looking at the LD relationship between SNPs and nearby common CNVs, and they found that it's very strong. You can tag most common CNVs pretty well with SNP data and as a result you should expect the imputation to be good. The bigger question for me is how well are those structural variants called within your reference panel. So um, structural variant calling, CNV calling remains kind of an open question in the bioinformatics community and um, we know some are called well, some are not called well. If you're relying on a reference panel like Thousand Genomes, the imputation is going to be as good as the calling process that was used to identify those structural variants. That's, that's about all I can say on it. Okay, thanks. Um, let's go ahead and just ask one more question. Uh, is there a step-by-step -step manual on handling dbGaP data sets, i.e. from downloading to converting to data types, the whole thing? So um, dbGaP does have some tutorials on their web page and that's a good place to start. And beyond that, I would say it's really helpful to talk to somebody who's done it before. And you will find on dbGaP as you click around on the individual studies that Anyone who has applied for access to that data will have their name listed on the web page. So you can look and see if there's somebody there you know that you can talk to and find out what their experience has been with it. I've had some experiences where we have directly contacted the original data submitters to ask some questions about the data and they've usually been friendly and responsive. But in general, I would say start by looking at the dbGaP tutorials and talk to somebody who's worked with dbGaP data before, whether um, it's the same data set you're using or another one. The process is pretty similar. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again so much uh, for your time today, Bryce, and uh, thank you everyone in the audience for joining us, and we hope that you have a great day.